Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Hi, Lawrence. Hey, Jen. Uh, we have breaking news on the October surprise. The first October surprise is now over, and that Court was strike. that was the, uh, the the dock strike, which was really uh, East Coast and Gulf Coast uh, ports shut down. That was going to be uh, disastrous. Uh, President Biden helped get that thing. Uh, fixed fast. Uh, they have agreed tentatively to a 62 percent increase in wages over the next six years. Uh, the first wow. offer that the union turned down, just to show you how far apart this was, was 40 percent. That's where this began. And so the pressure that the union uh, put on uh, really did work. And of course, the, the, uh, the port uh, companies, they were hoping that President Biden would feel the pressure of this and, and just uh, order a Taft-Hartley return to work by that union to mm -hmm. get through the election. Uh, and you can imagine how uh, the companies thought the, pr the president's going to have to do this because this will be so difficult you know, for the Harris campaign. Uh, but the president uh, just kept the administration pushing both sides. Uh, to an agreement they had at 5.30. You can imagine how this was at the White House. White House Chief of Staff Jeff Science is on, the, uh, on a Zoom, Pete Buttigieg and others in the administration with both sides forcing them to get together. Uh, and so uh, both sides understood that it looked like the president was not ready to intervene on this. And so they'd better figure something out. And they did. I mean, no one should underestimate, as you've said many times, President Biden's love for union workers and standing up for workers. It's a big victory for them. But also the administration, this was, this was resolving it quite quickly. I think mm -hmm. you know well how government works very, very well. This was a quick resolution. It could have had an impact on the supply chain. Mm -hmm. That would have been a big, challenging October surprise. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure the shippers were just sitting there thinking, oh, you know, the president's going to have to do a ta Taft-Hartley, order these guys back to work, order, order everyone back to work at the docks uh, so that we will not have to give them this raise. We can just continue negotiating and drag this out. But uh, here we are. They've got uh, a real success there for the union. A big one. And I think they underestimated. You know, I've read back, you probably have, op-eds that Joe Biden wrote in yeah. the 70s and 80s, right, where he talks about raising the minimum wage. He talks about the rights of workers. This is kind of who he is in his very soul. So this is a moment, perhaps, to your point, he was a bit underestimated on that front, which he's quite used to. Well, that looks like they got the job done. And so much. So one October surprise is over. One, one done. A few <laughs> right. more to go. Right. We will see. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Have a great show, Lawrence. Thank you. Well, Elizabeth Lynn Cheney, as it happens, was born in Wisconsin in 1966 when her parents were graduate students at the University of Wisconsin. 112 years before that, the Republican Party was born in Wisconsin. Liz Cheney was born a Republican. When she was in elementary school, her father was deputy chief of staff in the Republican White House of President Gerald Ford. Dick Cheney moved up to White House chief of staff in the Ford White House, then ran for Congress in Wyoming, then secretary of defense for the first President Bush, then vice president for the second President Bush. Liz Cheney is more Republican than anyone named Trump ever could be because no one in Donald Trump's family actually believes in anything. In uh, 1976, when I was 10 years old, and I was sealing envelopes for President Ford's re-election campaign, I cast my first vote ever in 1984 for Ronald Reagan. I served in the State Department in both Bush administrations, and I served in the United States House of Representatives for three terms, including as the third highest ranking Republican in House leadership. So, in other words, I was a Republican even before Donald Trump started spray tanning. Liz Cheney went to the small town in Wisconsin today where the Republican Party was born in the hope that what she had to say would be heard by Republicans like her who have never voted for a Democrat in their lives. I know that our security and our freedom depend upon a world in which America 
with our allies leads. And above all else, I know that the most conservative of conservative values is fidelity to our Constitution. I tell you, I have never voted for a Democrat, but this year I am proudly casting my vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. President Harris is standing in the breach at a critical moment in our nation's history. She's working to unite reasonable people from all across the political spectrum. <laughs> Vice President Harris has dedicated her life to public service. I know, I know that she loves our country and I know that she will be a president for all Americans. As a conservative, as a patriot, as a mother, as someone who reveres our Constitution, I am honored to join her in this urgent cause. Liz Cheney echoed her role as chief Republican investigator of Donald Trump on the January 6th committee. When Donald Trump woke up on the morning of January 6, 2021. His intention, despite having lost the election, was that he would remain president. Rather than accept his loss and concede defeat, he had spent months overseeing a multi-part plan to attempt to seize power and remain in office. He ignored the rulings of the courts. He corruptly pressured state legislatures, including here in Wisconsin, to overturn the results of their elections, Donald Trump watched the attack on television for hours, for hours. Sitting in the dining room next to the Oval Office, he refused repeated pleas from his family, from his closest advisors, from the most senior officials in his campaign and in our government to tell the mob to leave. And when Donald Trump finally did speak publicly after hours of violence, after the Capitol had been invaded, he praised the rioters. He did not condemn them. That's who Donald Trump is. Those facts do not come from Donald Trump's political opponents. Those facts come from the people closest to him. They are the ones who testified that Donald Trump did not want to stop the violent attack on our Capitol. When he learned that Vice President Pence was not going to abandon his oath and help Trump seize power, Trump sent out a tweet attacking Pence and further inflaming the mob. One of Trump's aides testified that shortly after that, this aide received a phone call alerting him that the vice president had been evacuated for his own safety from his office off the floor of the Senate. This aide recalled rushing to the dining room to tell Trump, hoping that this information would convince him to take immediate action to ensure the vice president's safety. Instead, after this aide delivered that news, Donald Trump looked up at him and said, so what? He said, so what? Donald Trump was willing to sacrifice our capital to allow law enforcement officers to be beaten and brutalized in his name and to violate the law and the Constitution in order to seize power for himself. I don't care if you are a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. That is depravity and we must never become numb to it. Any person...
Any person who would do these things can never be trusted with power again. We must defeat Donald Trump on November 5th. We have never seen anything like January 6th until Donald Trump. And we have never seen anything like Liz Cheney campaigning against the Republican candidate for president, trying to elect a Democrat until Donald Trump. Nowhere in our political history did a large collection of prominent party members turn against their party's nominee for president the way Liz Cheney and so many other prominent Republicans, including her father, have turned against Donald Trump. In the first year of Donald Trump's political candidacy, 2015, I said at the time, if you don't have children or grandchildren, you will be asked for the rest of your life, what did you do to stop Donald Trump? Liz Cheney has now been trying to stop Donald Trump for three years. Liz Cheney now has an answer to what has she done to try to stop Donald Trump. Liz Cheney has brought the country to the point that she now calls our time of testing. So help us right the ship of our democracy so that history will say of us, when our time of testing came, we did our duty and we prevailed because we loved our country more. When our time of testing came, Liz Cheney passed that test with honor, leaving behind every Republican member of the House and Senate who continue to fail that test. They fail that test because they love their jobs in politics more than they love their country, and they fear that they could lose their jobs in politics the way Liz Cheney lost hers if they follow Liz Cheney in doing and saying the right thing. Liz Cheney knew what she could lose in Congress by opposing Donald Trump's attack on the Capitol and joining an investigation to expose the truth about what Donald Trump did leading up to and on January 6th. First, she lost her leadership position in the House of Representatives. Then she lost her reelection campaign in Wyoming to a wildly underqualified candidate who was then welcomed into the Trump worshipers in the Republican House of Representatives. Liz Cheney has never said that it was a hard choice. She has never said that choosing between her country and Donald Trump was a difficult choice or required heroism of any kind. When our time of testing came, in fact, it was an easy test for Liz Cheney. And the shock is not that lifelong Republican Liz Cheney passed that test. The shock is that almost everyone else, every other Republican holding office in Washington, everyone else in her party failed that test. Vice President Harris is grateful to Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney really is a leader who puts country above party and above self, a true patriot, and it is my profound honor, my profound honor to have your support. And your words today and the reason we are all here today, I think really uh, do underscore perhaps one of the most fundamental questions that is facing the American people in this election. Who will obey that oath? Who will abide by the oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States of America? I have had the privilege Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I have sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution six times in my career, um, including as Vice President, as a United States Senator, and as the top law enforcement officer of the largest state in our country. 
responsible for upholding and enforcing the laws of the state and the laws of the United States was the work I did. And I have never wavered in upholding that oath. And I have always executed it faithfully and without reservation. And therein lies the profound difference between Donald Trump and me. He, who violated the oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. And make no mistake, he, who, if given the chance, would violate it again. I know the vast majority of us agree that upholding the Constitution must be a basic requirement. We expect of anyone seeking the highest office in the land. I know the vast majority of us, regardless of your political party, agree we must hold sacred America's fundamental principles, from the rule of law to free and fair elections to the peaceful transfer of power. And if you share, if you share that view, no matter your political party, there is a place for you with us and in this campaign. Because those principles, I know, unite us across party lines. And in this election, I take seriously my pledge to be a president for all Americans. The President of the United States must not look at our country through the narrow lens of ideology or petty partisanship or self-interest. The President of the United States must not look at our country as an instrument for their own ambitions. Our nation is not some spoil to be won. The United States of America is the greatest idea humanity ever devised. The nation that inspired the world to believe in the possibilities of a representative government. And so in the face of those who would endanger our magnificent experiment, people of every party must stand together. And let me be clear. Democracy and freedom are not only at stake here at home. They are also at stake around the world. As President of the United States, I will strengthen, not abdicate, America's global leadership. So we are gathered here today in Ripon, not far, as the Congresswoman mentioned, from a small building where the Republican Party was born in 1854. Liz Cheney stands in the finest tradition of its leaders. And if, and if people across Wisconsin and our nation are willing to do what Liz is doing, to stand up for the rule of law, for our democratic ideals and the Constitution of the United States, then together I know we can chart a new way forward, not as members of any one party, but as Americans. <laughs> Americans who are united united in our devotion to the country we love. I thank you all. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. And we have a statement from the vice president on the settlement of the dock strike. Uh, she says, 
I want to applaud all involved for their efforts. This step indicates progress toward a strong contract and represents the power of collective bargaining. As I have said, this is about fairness and our economy works best when workers share in record profits. Dock workers deserve a fair share for their hard work getting essential goods out to communities across America. We also have uh, indications from the White House that President Biden specifically refused to invoke uh, Taft-Hartley. That would have benefited uh, the shippers that would have forced the union back to work without an agreement. Uh, that's a pressure that the president has in a situation like this. Uh, by not invoking Taft-Hartley, that put the pressure on the shippers to reach an agreement with the union, which they then very quickly did. Coming up, Liz Cheney and Kamala Harris talked about national security today in Wisconsin and how unfit Donald Trump is to serve as commander in chief. Former ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice, will join us next to consider what is at stake for the United States and the world in the presidential election. That's next. I want Ukraine to prevail. By contrast, in our debate, Donald Trump couldn't even bring himself to say he wanted Ukraine to win the war. Couldn't even bring himself to say that. A war that Putin, a brutal dictator, launched against a free and independent people. Trump wants to force Ukraine to give up its sovereign territory. A bedrock principle upon which we stand and fight for. And you know who else wants them to give up their sovereign? T absolutely, territory? Putin. Putin. And that's not a plan for peace. It's a plan for surrender. Well, I believe that in the global struggle between tyranny and democracy, the President of the United States must always be on the side of freedom. Joining us now is Susan Rice, who served as Ambassador to the United Nations and National Security Advisor to President Obama, and then served as President Biden's Director of Domestic Policy. Ambassador Rice, thank you very much for joining us tonight. When you hear the Vice President say that today in Wisconsin, what would you tell voters is at stake in this election in foreign policy terms and national security terms. Lawrence, it's great to be with you. Uh, it couldn't be a starker choice. In Kamala Harris, we have somebody who understands that America is stronger when we stand with our allies and partners, uh, when we stand up for our values and for democracy and for freedom, uh, when we stand up against aggression uh, and uh, violations of international law. Uh, and that is why uh, she and the vast majority of responsible national security uh, professionals believe it is essential that the United States and NATO continue to stand with Ukraine. On the other hand, you have Donald Trump, who uh, praises dictators, uh, loves Vladimir Putin inexplicably, and Xi Jinping, who calls a great leader, uh, who has denigrated our allies and, and said to NATO that, that, as far as he's concerned, Putin can do what the hell he wants with NATO countries. Uh, he would sell out Ukraine in a heartbeat, as, she, as Vice President Harris said on the clip you just showed during the debate. Donald Trump refused to say that he wanted Ukraine to win. He doesn't want Ukraine to win. He wants Russia to win, his pal Vladimir Putin. And nothing could be more dangerous or antithetical to our national security interests, because anybody who thinks that if Vladimir Putin wins in Ukraine, that he's going to stop there and not keep going into Europe, as he has done Georgia and Crimea and now Ukraine, they're out of their minds. And if anybody thinks that Xi Jinping in China won't take from the experience of Ukraine, that if Putin can get away with Ukraine, then he can get away with Taiwan, and then it's uh, really a crisis of global proportions. I want to uh, listen to the way the vice president framed it at the debate, because uh, she expanded the uh, the area of concern there uh, from not just Ukraine, but neighboring Poland and what that could mean to American voters. Let's listen to that. 
Putin's agenda is not just about Ukraine. Understand why the European allies and our NATO allies are so thankful that you are no longer president and that we understand the importance of the greatest military alliance the world has ever known, which is NATO, and what we have done to preserve the ability of Zelensky and the Ukrainians to fight for their independence. Otherwise, Putin would be sitting in Kyiv with his eyes on the rest of Europe, starting with Poland. And why don't you tell the 800,000 Polish Americans right here in Pennsylvania how quickly you would give up for the sake of favor and what you think is a friendship with what is known to be a dictator who would eat you for lunch. When you, I know when you serve uh, as ambassador of the United Nations, you're in constant contact uh, with the representatives of these other countries, especially in that region. Uh, what does it mean to the other countries in that region close to Ukraine as Ukraine fights for its survival? Well, the Eastern European countries, the Baltics, uh, Poland, and, and everybody on that front line uh, of Russia know that this is existential for them as well. Putin has been very clear. He hates NATO. He hates the fact that, that we have the strongest alliance that the world has ever seen. And his ambition is to break NATO and seize NATO territory. And he's been plain about that. The, the reason why he was so, uh, one of the many reasons why he was so uh, intent on invading Ukraine is because he feared that Ukraine might one day wish to join NATO and have the opportunity to do so. Uh, as well as to uh, join the European Union. Um, and so, you know, we need to understand that Putin has no intention uh, of stopping in eastern Ukraine unless he is forced to stop, which is why there's such unity uh, within NATO and why the countries of Eastern Europe in particular and the peoples of Eastern Europe, many millions of whom are here in the United States, understand that this is really an existential uh, choice. Uh, Donald Trump is out for himself. He's easily flattered and, and manipulated by dictators. And that's why, Lawrence, we all have to remember that his vice president, two of his national security advisors, his defense secretaries, and his secretary of state have all said in one way or another that he is unfit to leave this country, that he is not capable of serving the national interest, but he is out for his own personal interest. Uh, you were part of a group of national security professionals, people who've served in both uh, Democratic and Republican administrations, who signed on uh, based to a letter to the American people, addressed to the American people, about why Donald Trump should not be president. This is a letter uh, unlike anything we've ever seen before in our political history. Uh, there has been so much overlap, in fact, uh, since World War II uh, between the parties on foreign policy that there was never a, a situation in which Republican uh, foreign policy or national security experts would ever feel themselves forced to come out and oppose a Republican candidate for president until Donald Trump. Uh, what was it like being part of that group coming together, something that uh, certainly back when you were serving uh, at the U.N., for example, in the Obama administration, would not have been something you'd ever see coming? Well, La Lawrence, look, you know, it, I, there's a saying that back in the day, uh, until recently, foreign policy and national security were, were played between the 40-yard lines between Democrats and Republicans. There, there was a, a center... Uh, that was a responsible, uh, you know, rational center. There were differences, uh, you know, of emphasis and tone and uh, approach on some things. But the fundamentals of national security, that America needs to be strong, that we need to stand with our allies, that we need to stand for our values, um, and that, uh, uh, you know, we have to mean what we say. <clears throat> These are very fundamental things that never used to be under... Uh, serious question. And along comes Donald Trump, who really is like the Neville Chamberlain uh, of the Republican Party. He's an appeaser. He's he's a surrender monkey. Uh, and that's what we're seeing uh, in his approach to Ukraine. Um, and frankly, you know, we've seen him, you know, fold to blandishments from Xi Jinping and any others, many others, when it's when it was convenient for him and served his personal interests. So that is why more than 700 Democrats, Republicans, and independents 
very senior national security leaders came together to oppose uh, Donald Trump and support Kamala Harris. And, and it's important to say it was also to support mm -hmm. Kamala Harris. They believe that she has the temperament and the and the intellect and the vision and the and the experience to be on day one an effective uh, and strong commander in chief. Ambassador Susan Rice, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Good to be with you, Lawrence. Thank you. Wisconsin voters could end end up not only deciding who the next president is, but which party controls the United States Senate. Senator Tammy Baldwin, who is running for re-election in Wisconsin with strong polling for, in her favor at the moment, will join us next. Today in Wisconsin, Kamala Harris and Liz Cheney discovered that their parents were at the University of Wisconsin at about the same time. Kamala Harris's father was an associate professor, her mother had a job there, while Liz Cheney's parents were grad students. I thank you all for being here, but I just, I have to emphasize that um, every time I come here, and, and, and Liz, I was actually a kid here too when my parents were at the University of Wisconsin, so we have that in common as well. Um, in fact, Tony Evers always says when I land, welcome home. A new Marquette Law School poll, the most reliable poll in Wisconsin, shows Kamala Harris at 52% and Donald Trump at 48%. That same poll shows Democratic Senator Tammy Baldwin pulling at 53% over her Republican challenger at 46%. In a rare endorsement of a Democrat, the largest general farm organization in Wisconsin is endorsing Senator Tammy Baldwin. The Wisconsin Farm Bureau Federation has endorsed Senator Tammy Baldwin Yesterday, the Harris Walls campaign released this ad featuring a Wisconsin farmer. I knew something was wrong. My head was just pounding. Come to find out, I've got a brain tumor the size of a grapefruit. It was $187,000 to get this taken out. Back then, most farmers couldn't afford health insurance. When the tumor came back, the Affordable Care Act saved my life and my farm. Trump is coming for our health care. That's pretty damn scary. Kamala Harris cares about us. She fought for us to get health care, and she's fighting for us to keep it. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message. Joining us now is Wisconsin's Democratic Senator Tammy Baldwin. She's running for her third term in the United States Senate. And Senator Baldwin, can you clear something up for me that I heard during the vice presidential debate? Uh, I heard J.D. Vance say that Donald Trump led a bipartisan effort to support the Affordable Care Act. I always thought he was trying to repeal it and attempted several times to repeal it. You were there. What happened? Well, without question, he was rooting for the Affordable Care Act to be overturned. And we saved it in the Senate by one vote. I'm sure you recall watching as Senator McCain, whose vote we were not sure how it would be cast, came in and went thumbs down. And by the way, it is very clear to me that many in the Republican Party are trying to do it all over again. Uh, my opponent said that he absolutely wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act ripping millions of people from their, their insurance from millions of people. I helped write the Affordable Care Act. And Lawrence, I'm bragging, but it was my amendment that allows young people to stay on their parents' health insurance until they turn 26. My opponent called that amendment stupid. So we couldn't have a sharper contrast at the presidential level or in a race like my own for United States Senate. Senator, I remember that amendment very well. I have credited you many times. That's, that provision has been very important to my family and to millions of families in America. And that's exactly the kind of thing that would disappear if Republicans got control of this process. Without question. And it's not just that. I mean, I think about in my own race for U.S. Senate against Eric Hovde, uh, the uh, California bank owner, uh, multimillionaire, he celebrated when uh, the Dobbs decision came down overturning Roe v. Wade. I am the author of the Women's Health Protection Act, which would restore those rights and freedoms nationally. 
He is going after Social Security and Medicare, all so that he can uh, support a $4 trillion tax giveaway to big corporations and wealthy people like himself. Meanwhile, I'm trying to make sure that Social Security is strengthened and around for generations to come. Same with Medicare. And I want tax breaks for working people and middle class people, not millionaires like my opponent. But I want to say that this race in Wisconsin is very tight right now. You showed uh, one poll. We had three polls announced yesterday. Two of them had me within the margin of error, one up mm -hmm. by one, one up by two. And so this has not escaped the notice of my opponent or Mitch McConnell and his super PAC. They are pouring millions of dollars into Wisconsin just in the last month. And I ask your viewers, if you want to fight back, if you want to help me, please give whatever you can, five, ten dollars at TammyBaldwin.com. Senator Tammy Baldwin, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Donald Trump is now so crazed on the campaign trail that even The New York Times is wondering in print if Donald Trump is drifting even farther from reality as he runs for president as the oldest nominee in the history of presidential campaigning. That's next. The New York Times reports that in a recent speech, Donald Trump, quote, who often criticizes President Biden for errors in his remarks, erroneously referred to Iran as Iraq. Later, he swapped in North Korea in a lament he had been making recently about Iran threatening his life, saying that the Secret Service had been burdened by the security needs of the recent UN General Assembly. Mr. Trump complained that officials said that we have to guard the United Nations, which meant the president of North Korea, who is basically trying to kill me. He added, so they want to guard him, but they don't want to guard me. Mr. Trump has previously boasted of his relationship with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, but his campaign has said it has been briefed about threats from Iran to assassinate him. And the man who wants to be commander in chief also said this. Good fighters, great fighters, I'll tell you. Among the best, they're actually among, they could take a knife. They were like Rambos. It's like putting a million Rambos. Good old Sylvester Stallone is my friend. But it's like putting a million Rambos. Somebody explained that to me. They're great fighters. It's like putting a Rambo. Give him a knife. And that's all he needs. And by the time he finishes, he'll go down and he slits the throats with. A million Rambos. The Harris Walls campaign released this ad. I'm really concerned about J.D. Vance being a heartbeat away from the presidency. He is an extremist. I certainly would like abortion to be illegal nationally. A danger to our democracy. J.D. Vance has said he would not have certified those electors. We really need to be ruthless when it comes to the exercise of power. A danger to our fundamental freedoms. If Trump wanted to distance himself from Project 2025, why did he pick Vance? He wrote the foreword for Heritage Foundation President Kevin Roberts' new book. You may know that we're good friends. He's not just weird or dangerous. He could be a heartbeat away from the Oval Office. Can he govern from prison? People should be concerned. And Anomalous. The former president, he's been off his game. Anomalous. He is so disoriented. <laughs> Would it take bets here? Joining our discussion now is Simon Rosenberg, Democratic strategist and author of Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Substack. Also with us, Stuart Stevens, a veteran of five Republican presidential campaigns. He was he ran the last sane Republican presidential campaign in 2012. He's a senior advisor at the Lincoln Project. And Stuart is the author of The Conspiracy to End America, Five Ways My Old Party is Driving Our Democracy to autocracy. And Stuart, let me begin with you tonight and what you saw in Liz Cheney endorsing the Democratic candidate for president. Yeah, you know, it's a big moment. Um, I worked closely with Liz. Uh, I first met her doing debate prep for her dad. And I, I got to tell you, man, she was so impressive. There, shockingly, were a number of people around Cheney who really thought a lot of themselves. And she had this ability to deal with them with the deafness and just a, a bit of humor, but always in control. 
And when I wrote a book about the Bush campaign called The Big Enchilada, I predicted that Liz would run for president. That was 2001. Now, I never thought, it, obviously, it would end up with the party collapsing like this. But her courage, her fearlessness, um, her absolute devotion to a greater cause and party, none of that surprises me. Simon, uh, weave into where the campaign is today, what we saw in Wisconsin with Liz Cheney endorsing Kamala Harris today. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Stuart. It's a major moment. Uh, it was an incredible affirmation of Kamala Harris as a strong leader. Uh, you know, I think we continue to every week that Kamala Harris has been in this race has been a good week for her. She hasn't had a major stumble or a struggle or a bad day, really, at any point. And we've had another good week here. And I feel, you know, we're slightly ahead in the polls. We're up by two, three, four points. We are in stronger shape in the battleground. We've got a much stronger campaign to close. Our candidates are much more popular and, and, and better liked than theirs are. I mean, we should feel good about where we are. And what I will tell you about this campaign that impresses me the most is they're pressing every button. They're trying to get every vote. They are leaving, they're incredibly hungry. And they're fighting for rural votes, for Republican votes, for uh, votes that have to do with a choice and abortion and reproductive freedom. They're firing on all cylinders. And it's very impressive about how much they're prosecuting and trying to you know, eke out every single vote they can in every state to win this thing by as much as they can. And meanwhile, Stuart, uh, the 78-year-old candidate continues to stumble. Uh, his words are just a mess all over the place. And now... You're left with questions about what that's about. Uh, is this part of the aging process? Uh, he's always been incoherent, but is this different? And is J.D. Vance, <laughs> is J.D. Vance in any way reassuring for people if uh, Donald Trump, for some reason, would not be able to finish his four years if he were elected? Yeah, listen, I, I, Trump is in decline. I mean, every day, that's the best Trump you get. The next day, he's worse. The next day, he's worse. And, you know, folks, this isn't going to correct itself. It's only going to be this way. It's going to accelerate. Um, and being tired and stressed and all of that doesn't help. And guess what the most stressful job in the world is? Being president. Um, you know, J.D. Vance is, is an odd character in American politics. He's talented, but his ability to reinvent himself, his need to, it's just extraordinary. I mean, this is a guy who bonded with sort of Northeast liberals over their mutual hatred of Donald Trump. And now he's up there uh, saying, you know, lying all this stuff, saying, if you really want to protect Obamacare, you need to vote for Trump. I mean, seriously, dude, really? That's really what it's come to? Um, and I, I think the guy uh, still gives off a very unsettling vibe. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been bothered by the term uh, smooth talking. People are saying, oh, he's a smooth talker. You know, when I was a kid, a smooth talker was someone who talked so smoothly, you couldn't catch that he was lying. You couldn't catch that, that, that this guy's lying all the time. That doesn't qualify as smooth talk for me. Uh, we got to leave it there. Simon Rosenberg, Stuart Stevens, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. We'll be Thanks right back. That's tonight's last word.